Hello, I'm Alec Avzakov, and welcome to the life and times of Frederick the Great. Before I begin, I would like to make a shout out to someone who produces quality historical content on a subject that I briefly discussed in one of my episodes. The podcast is called Three Decades of Tragedy, A History of the Thirty Years' War, and I have found it extremely interesting and informative. It goes through a chronological and detailed look at the Thirty Years' War from a grand scale, and if you find the subject of the 1600s interesting, you will definitely find this podcast intriguing. Again, this podcast is called Three Decades of Tragedy, A History of the Thirty Years' War and is found pretty much anywhere there are podcasts, on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and Stitcher. I really have enjoyed listening to his podcast, so go check him out. Also, do not forget to go to Patreon to listen to exclusive content and help keep the show going. I depend upon you all to help me make this a better show. You can also rate me on Apple Podcasts or follow me on if you're on Podbean, because every little bit of support goes a long way. Thank you all for listening, and now, let us get on to the show. I last left you off in the autumn of 1721, when the final hurrah of the Swedish Empire was shouted into the heavens. We saw how Charles XII boldly lost his army and empire in the Battle of Poltava, and the slow rise of Russia into great power status under Tsar Peter the Great. We also saw a young man rise to become the king in Prussia. This man was a short-tempered autocrat. One might call him a tyrant and a scoundrel. He was a cruel man who threatened death to his own son. This man was the soldier king, Frederick Wilhelm, and he was the father of Frederick the Great. Frederick Wilhelm of Prussia was born on a dry summer's day on August 14, 1688. If you remember the long lists of horrible fathers from the Hohenzollern royal family, you will recollect how Frederick I of Prussia's father, the great elector, basically called the future king good for nothing and did not help him with the transition to become king. Therefore, When young Frederick Wilhelm was growing up, King Frederick wanted to be sure that he was given the education to become a king. As far as fathers were in the Hohenzollern royal family, King Frederick I was, in my opinion, probably the best in the early modern period of history. Frederick was leaps and bounds better than his son would be to his grandson. According to the book that I've quoted throughout this podcast, The Iron Kingdom, by Christopher Clark, Frederick III, later crowned Frederick I of Prussia, was determined not to repeat the era of his predecessors, and went to great pains to provide his heir with both the fullest possible training in government and with a quasi-independent area of action in which to develop his capacities. This was truly an honorable pursuit for his son. However, his son may not have made the most of his opportunities. Frederick Wilhelm was always looking for a distraction, and if he were tested today, he might have been diagnosed with both ADHD and dyslexia. But hey, I'm no doctor, so... uh. His poor tutor, who I believe was a French Huguenot, or a French Protestant, but I could be wrong, even said that he would rather have been a galley slave than Frederick Wilhelm's tutor. Okay, chief, I don't think you'd really want to be a slave considering you've never been to Haiti, but okay, you do, you Frenchie. Anyway, Frederick Wilhelm grew to despise how his father ran his court, but still kept deference to his father. That is, until the horrible plague of 1709 through 1710. By this point, Frederick I was just letting his ministers walk all over him. Corruption was the order of the day in the late reign of Frederick I, and Frederick Wilhelm despised it. Frederick I, learning from both his father's and grandfather's mistakes, 
decided to have a sort of power-sharing deal between himself and his son during the last years of his reign to avoid a family rift. I'm actually surprised that there is one person I genuinely sympathize in this podcast in the Hohenzollern royal family. Frederick I has been nothing but agreeable to the people around him, and only a few times has he been a little paranoid. But he had a terrible father, and look at him now. He's trying to be a good father to this crazy teenager wanting to become king. It almost makes me sad that we're going to have to kill him off in today's episode. Anyway, Frederick I of Prussia died on February 25th, 1713, aged 55 years old. Oh, well. So, that caused his insane son to become king when he was only 24 years old. As we saw in the last episode, Frederick I was cautious to go on any Baltic war against the Swedes and wanted to wait until the War of Spanish Succession was over, a war in which he committed 20,000 soldiers, or half of his troops, so, when Frederick died, the War of Spanish Succession was just wrapping up, and that meant Frederick Wilhelm could turn his troops north against the Swedes. And then, yada yada yada, King Charles XII comes back to Sweden, Swedish Pomerania is conquered by the Prussians, and then peace is declared between Sweden and Prussia in 1720, but you all know that already from the last episode. This episode, we are not going to be focusing on the geopolitics or the court politics of the Tobaks Collegium, or even Frederick Wilhelm's marriage, in which he produced, wait, 14 children? No, we're not going to talk about any of that. Frederick Wilhelm has a nickname that he absolutely deserved. In German, he was called Die Soldatenkönig, or in English, the Soldier King. So yeah, we're going to be talking about his expansion and reforms of the army. But why, you may ask? I have been waiting for nine whole episodes and you still haven't even talked about Frederick the Great being born yet. Well, essentially, the army that Frederick inherited was Frederick Wilhelm's army. The army that won Molwitz and Kotusitz and von Friedberg and all the other battles that I will soon talk about was Frederick Wilhelm's army. It was Frederick Wilhelm's infantry, a force that was constantly drilled and expanded during peacetime, that it knew exactly how to move like living walls at the enemy, because they were veterans of the parade ground. This is where the now infamous Stechschritt, or Goose Step, was introduced by General Feldmarschall Prince Leopold the first von Anhalt Dessau. He was also known as der alte Dessau in German, or the old man from Dessau in English. He began serving the Prussian army in 1693 and would become the one of Prussia's greatest military commanders and would serve even up until Frederick the Great's reign. Anyway, let's talk about the Prussian army. Frederick Wilhelm inherited an army of 40,000 men and was gaining a reputation to be one of the best in Europe, especially after the cream of the Swedish army was destroyed at the Battle of Poltava. This was a time after the Thirty Years' War when armies were mainly composed of mercenaries or soldiers who were uh, fought only for money. And it was before armies were composed of patriotic soldiers that were conscripted and ready to die for the nation. This was also a time when battles were fought in open fields and lines. Linear warfare to the modern ear sounds not only barbaric, but stupid. I mean, why stand there to be shot in plain sight with your bright blue uniforms like a bunch of idiots? Now, this judgment is not actually fair. Remember that there is such a thing as strategic ground that must be held at all costs. These tend to be in front of major towns or crossroads in which a lot of resources are exchanged. Logistics are one of the most important factors to the success of a campaign, as we saw in the disastrous invasion of Russia by Sweden in 1709 through 1710. 
Your soldiers could be the bravest and most disciplined in the world. But if your army has no food, it cannot fight. So therefore, armies tended to attack open fields because those fields had grain. And grain is an immensely important resource when it comes to a pre-industrial society, as Prussia was in the 1700s. Another factor that causes lineal warfare is that the technology of the guns at the time made fighting in lines the most effective. Guns were extremely faulty and inaccurate at the time. The effective range of a brown bess, the musket that the British Army used throughout the 1700s, was about 100 yards. Match that with a firing rate of 4 to 6 rounds per minute, and it begins to make more sense that the most effective way to use your soldiers is to pack them close together in a long line to give the most accurate and deadly volley that would strike fear into the enemy's hearts. Another factor was desertion. When one thinks of war at the time, you think of people lining up to fire at each other just like a chivalrous sport. Well, war at the time was anything but. The pay was bad, the food was bad, your diet most likely consists of hardtack, essentially water and flour mixed together and cooked. Food usually rotted before it got to you. Soldiers were considered the lower rungs of your society, and not the fighting heroes as they were in the 19th and 20th centuries. Discipline was also extremely harsh for minor offenses. Here's what David Frazier had to say about discipline in his book about Frederick the Great. As in other armies, casual blows were administered for trivial failings. Capital offenses meant death by hanging or firing squad. Short of the death penalty, the most feared formal punishment was the Gassenlaufen, literally running down the lane, and often called running the gauntlet. This, unless circumstances prescribed execution, was the usual award by court-martial for desertion. Two runs of soldiers, each of them 100 men, were drawn up facing inwards to form a lane. Each soldier was armed with a hazel switch. The condemned man, stripped to the waist, walked down the lane so that every man could strike him. He was forbidden to run, a ban enforced by a non-commissioned officer walking backwards in front of him with a leveled carbine. At the end of the lane, he turned about for a repeat performance until the sentence awarded of a given number of runs was completed. A, a desertion ranked 12 runs for the first offense. The maximum sentence permitted, 36 runs, was spread over three days. So essentially, 12 runs in the gauntlet meant that you're getting hit 2,400 times with a thick stick on your bare back. As was said in a Nazi propaganda film called Kolberg, sometimes you think you're broken, and yet another blow hit us harder. With that quote, I mean, you think that's bad, Wait till you hear about how bad battle was at the time. Battle was loud and chaotic. Cannon fire deafened you, and iron balls could kill over ten people at a time because you were packed so tightly together. Imagine this. You and your friend Paul, who you have been a friend with for years, are marching. You are his best man at his wedding. You eat together. You sleep next to him. You have built up this connection through the hardship of winter and constant drill and discipline and training. You are marching up this hill against the Austrians, and suddenly you hear a whistle and blood is on your face. Your good comrade, who you have spent years with, has fallen, and you don't know whether he is dead or not. Yet you march on, because you know that if you turn around, you will have to run through the gauntlet or cause many more deaths if your regiment flees the battle. Better to keep marching forward to look than to look at poor Paul.
Any one of these pressures could make a man desert, and the armies packed in tight, because the morale of the soldier meant the difference between glory and defeat. By the end of Frederick Wilhelm's reign, the army increased from 40,000 to just over 80,000 men, and he had a war chest of 8.7 million thalers. This meant that Prussia had the fourth largest army in Europe, despite being fairly poor and having a low population. But why did he do that? Let me once again quote the Iron Kingdom to help explain why. The king justified the immense costs involved by arguing that only a well-trained and independently financed fighting force would provide him with the autonomy in international affairs that had been denied to his father and grandfather. However, the book goes on to argue that the army was an end unto itself, an argument that I can get behind. See, Frederick Wilhelm, despite his hatred for pacifist groups and believing that the army was the closest thing to a utopian society, never really used his army for political goals. I mean, sure, he conquered half of Swedish Pomerania in the Great Northern War, but that was it. From 1720 until his death in 1740, there was peace in Prussia. I think he was simply afraid to spill his army's blood because that was his only true passion in his life. Here's a stupid story about Frederick Wilhelm's obsession with the army. So, Frederick Wilhelm had this weird thing about wanting to have really tall soldiers. And I mean really tall. I mean, a British diplomat once reported seeing a man who was 7 foot 6. Throughout all Europe, Frederick Wilhelm recruited, some would say kidnapped, men who were extremely tall. These men were called der lange Kels, or the tall lads. These soldiers had to be at least six foot two in order to be in the unit, and Frederick Wilhelm spent a tremendous amount of money on these tall boys. The unit would eventually grow to a number of 2,500 men. Some of these soldiers were actually disabled <laughs> because they were so tall and they just couldn't fight. So you have these freakishly tall guys who are disabled and can't fight and Frederick Wilhelm's over here saying, Ah, yes, these grenadiers are the most valuable men in all of Europe. That's how he sounds in my head. Anyway, to conclude this episode, we're going to round it out with a talk about how Prussia managed to expand his army twofold in a single reign. The system that Prussia used to make its army the fourth largest in Europe was a semi-modern system of universal conscription. This was called the cantonal system. This elegant sounding system started out just basically kidnapping people from their villages in order to simply increase the number of tall men in the army. There was even bloodshed in some cases. However, once Europe asked just what the heck Frederick Wilhelm think was he was doing when there was peace, he settled down to some normality. Here's what David Frazier's book had to say about the cantonal system. The army must be well-rooted in the population. Frederick Wilhelm instituted a cantonal system for recruitment so that each of his regiments had its recruiting districts the districts differed widely in size, and its responsibilities for registration, for maintaining lists of young men, organizing the periodic enrollments, recording the extensive rules of exemptions for artisans, and so forth. Only about half of the reg any registration were actually called up, and after initial training, the cantonist served two months in the year with the colors and went home for the balance, always liable to recall in an emergency. Therefore, the cantonal system had the principle of universal conscription, but in practice, there were a ton of exemptions that allowed people to stay out of the army. One exemption, oddly enough, but on character of Frederick Wilhelm, was to just be short. People who were of short stature tended to be conscripted as porters, but 
were never actually used in the army as soldiers. Frederick the Great was a strong believer in the cantonal system. He wrote, Who will seem most brave? Friends and relations who fight together don't lightly let each other down. Well, there you have it. The army that Frederick Wilhelm deemed his only true pleasure and too valuable to use. The cantonal system will do wonders when we talk about the military campaigns of Frederick the Great. But this is where I shall have to leave you at. Frederick Wilhelm I coming to power and making Prussia's army the envy of Europe. However, never truly using it to its full potential. No, that was for his son to accomplish. To conclude this week, I believe I will quote a song called Ich hat einen Kameraden. I had a comrade to symbolize the loss in battle in this barbaric time of linear warfare. Ich hat einen Kameraden, einen besseren findest du nicht. Die Trommel schlug zum Streite, er ging an meiner Seite, im gleichen Schritt und Tritt, im gleichen Schritt und Tritt. Eine Kugel kam geflogen, gilt's mir oder gilt es dir? In hartes weggerissen, er liegt zu meinen Füßen, als wär's ein Stück von mir, als wär's ein Stück von mir. Will mir die Hand noch reichen, der Wall ich eben lad, kann dir die Hand nicht geben, bleib du in ewig leben, mein guter Kamerad, mein guter Kamerad. Goodbye.